Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the show. If you've been following this series, Live Well with Barry, you know it's about inspirational people who are doing great things in the community and who inspire us to be better people. This week we have none other than acting royalty, Martina Laird. I bow before you. I have been following this lady since casualty days and I'm just in awe, as you can see, a little excited. <laughs> Lovely to see you. It's really mm, cool lovely. to be here. Mm. Oh my God, you're such a <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm really good. I'm very happy to be here as well, because you've arranged something absolutely wonderful. And the sights of London and where we live, it's, it's beautiful. Very Deserving of, you know, acting royalty. I had Aww, to find the perfect I know, venue. I know, thank you. This is like a little palace. <laughs> <laughs> How has it all started for you, mm -hmm. your journey? Because I know you're Trinidadian, and mm -hmm. one of the things that I absolutely love is that you've kept the accent. Yeah. You haven't even remotely tried to alter it, <laughs> change it. It is the minute you open your mouth to Martina, Trini to the bone, as Trini we say. Well, I have to admit, because I'm an actor, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a parrot. So it kind of also depends on what situation or you know Obviously. environment that I find myself. Um, and when I'm comfortable, yeah. So when I'm amongst my own Trinidadians, or when I'm comfortable, my yeah. accent will come out even more. So I guess I'm comfortable. <laughs> Good. I like that. <laughs> okay. When did you come to England? I came to England in my teens, um, basically to continue my education. Right. Um, most Trinidadians will, at, well. In my generation, most Trinidadians from my school kind of background went to the States or to England for further education. And right, you, yeah. you choose what you do after that. Um, I came to England because my dad is English. Um, my dad was English. Uh, and um, I, I was at that generation where people were starting to go more now towards the States and towards Canada. So it was kind of unusual that I came to England. Yeah, because you said, when did you come here? In your teens? Yeah, Which... in my teens. Are you looking for specific dates? Mm, well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Late 80s. Right, say. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because. As you say, uh, by that stage, I know a lot of my family because, as you know, I'm half Trini. Yes. We're really propelled towards the U.S. That's right. That's for right. their further education. It's interesting because the Caribbean is a location of colonialism of one sort or another. Oh, always, yeah. always, the always has been. Caribbean as it exists. Yeah. That way. Um, and you know, Trinidad, Trinidad, like um, other islands got independence in the 60s, we were 1962, um, we got independence from the British Empire. British, yeah. Uh, but it's interesting to observe the new forms of infiltration, of occupation, of colonialism that happens, and they're not necessarily all political, though mm. overtly they are. Um, there's also, or covertly they are, but they are cultural and, and the rest of it. Yeah. So, yeah, so that um, setting sights on America and the North American continent became a, a big thing from my generation onwards. Right. How was school life in Trinidad? Oh gosh, school life was great. Yeah. I love school. In fact, I remember teaching I me, you love school though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad because there are very few people that I've spoken to that have said I, that they love school. And to me, I loved school. I loved school. Um, I went to a sort of co-educational co primary school. But unfortunately, maybe, or fortunately, I don't know, this is a debate, um, the, pro the secondary schools in Trinidad, because we were still working under the common entrance system. That's right, which yeah. Which we inherited, I believe, as England was getting rid of it. Yeah. We decided that it was an unfair system. So we inherited it just at that kind of point. So um, you got allocated schooling uh, according to your common entrance results at 11, 11 That's months. right, yeah. I was 10 when I sat mine, but yeah. It's See how bright months. she is? 10, when everybody um, else was doing it at 11. <laughs> um, but, so I ended up at Bishop Anstey High School. All right. Uh, which was also the alma mater of my sisters before me, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, etc. So there was a nice family history there. Um, 
And I went through all the stages of, of teenage years, of rebellion, and then of being taken back under the wing, <laughs> and then of flourishing. So yeah. I ended up doing well, sort of academically, but also being given a space, which didn't really exist in Trinidad, for the my creativity. kind of creativity yeah. to take place and given a stage. And whatever kind of form that was, as, as infant as it might have been, it, um, it, it meant that I continued to kind of express myself. And, and, and it was encouraged. And it was encouraged. That's the important Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And I had great friends who joined in with me going, oh my God, Martina, you're crazy, but we're going to do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Because you know that like, certain generation in yeah. the Caribbean, you say you want to do creative things, they don't get it. Yeah. You know, it's, but I, I was lucky. Yeah. Um, also, because down the road, um, so I had all my friends at Bishops who would participate in my kind of madcap um, little uh, stage scenarios that I would put together. Uh, and then down the road, there was a school called St. Mary's College, or we, what we call CIC. And a lot of my best friends also went there. And as it goes, they're still here. They're over here in England now, and they're practicing opera stars and things like this. Really? Um, but they and I kind of had this... We didn't know that this is what it was then, At but the it time. was a kind of a support <laughs> system. So we would be participating in talent things, things and in each other's presentations yeah. and shows and, and cheering. We were, we were each other's cheerleaders throughout our, our teenage years. Well, and the thing is, you know those are your genuine friends because they were there oh, in the them. beginning. Oh, yeah, they're family. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're beyond friends, yeah, actually. Yeah, they're they family. family. They were there in the beginning. They yeah. supported every part of Correct. your journey. And continue to. Yeah, and yeah. continue to. Yeah. Where in Trinidad did you grow up? I grew up in Port of Spain. I grew up all over Port of Spain, but I'm one of those Trinidadians <laughs> that didn't venture beyond <laughs> much <The city>. beyond. <laughs> I, I shame. I'm so ashamed. But um, but yeah, my friends, however, because that was that was the one good thing about the common entrance is right. that. Okay, maybe it's not such a good thing that people <laughs> had to do the traveling, but it meant that people from all over Trinidad, all over the island, came together for education and, for, and to grow up alongside yeah. each other. And so I had friends that came from all over um, Trinidad. Um, and that, that's great, because my, <laughs> my upbringing was rather sheltered otherwise. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for them to see you, they I had know, to come to you. I you know, weren't going out there. It was a little bit like that. It was a bit, but you know, um, as we say, I was old people children. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> get it. Yeah, I understand perfectly. <laughs> old people children. <laughs> you see, that's what I like. How real that is. Old people children. Old people children. You either know or you don't know. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. But what was your first job? My first job. Job. So I always got confused because there's three possibilities. <laughs> um, I did a little, a very short stint on East Enders back in the day when Nick. Cotton I'm talking was job being before before acting before acting. What was job your before first job? Acting. Yeah, can you think that far back? <laughs> um, I. Well, I was a student, and right. I... Were you working through your studies? As, oh, yeah, I did all the waitressing. I did okay. the working in retail. I did all those things that you do as a student. I was based in Canterbury when I came over. I went to university okay. first. Um, and, and what um, did you study? I did French, and I did drama. Um, so it meant that I was there for a while. My course ended up being four years. And then right. I went to drama school. Um, drama school was very busy. In a way, it was much busier than university. <laughs> um, so, but I worked during my university years. Exactly, like, absolutely. Yeah, because most people yeah. would work yeah, through their absolutely. studying to subsidize. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I was not a very good waitress though, because I'm naturally clumsy. And um, that doesn't look at this regal <laughs> I position. Am naturally can you imagine this being clumsy? Absolutely I not. I continue to be clumsy. I have always been, and I continue to be clumsy. And I remember spilling red wine all over. It was the 80s, and we all wore sort of silk 
puffer jackets <laughs> and things that yeah. well, the rich people did. And there was a, there was someone um, I was serving, and I spilled red wine all over her silk um, designer puffer jacket. And I just looked at her, and I just started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Which was actually the best form of defense, apparently, yeah. because she then she sat like, oh, me down and bought right. me a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all right, darling. But it's just like, so I ended up being comforted. See, and you started a... acting from then. <laughs> acting, acting is truth. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> do you come from a big family? I do. Um, I do come from a big family. Um, Lots of brothers and sisters? Unfortunately for me... <laughs> Um, my brothers and sisters are quite a bit older than I, so okay. they had left home by the time I was, you know, kind of developing. And, yeah. and um, so I essentially grew up an only child, but All right. also had brothers and sisters. So How many of you are there? Well, it depends which number you're counting. No. It's the West Indies. <laughs> Um, so I grew up with an older brother and two older sisters. Right. Um, and then my nephews came up behind me, and they uh, were, they were nearer to me essentially in age. In age, yeah, yeah. because the gap between yeah, you and exactly. your brothers and sisters. Exactly. I mean, I'm kind of in the same situation, and I find when people are talking about sibling rivalry, it didn't exist it didn't for exist me. Didn't exist for me. Absolutely. It was almost as if I had an extra father. I, correct, or uncles yeah, and yeah, aunts. Absolutely, you know? and. This is going to sound sad, but my best friend was like my dog. <laughs> so Me sad. too. I'm You're sorry. not alone. <laughs> <laughs> I love my dog. Uh, so you came to England to study, started yes. in Canterbury. Yes. Did your drama, yes. French. Yes. Where did you move on from that? Well, from there, um, because in the West Indies at the time, it was, well, in Trinidad at the time, it was not really possible to just be a professional actor. Right. You, the, I grew up with the influence of some fantastic actors. Eunice Allen, um, Wilbert Holder, uh, Brenda Soon, etc. They were like really fabulous actors that were influences on me. Um, Errol, jo Errol John, sorry. Um, sorry, Errol Jones, because it's Errol Jones and Errol John. John one's yeah. a writer and one's an actor. And... Um, the thing is that in Trinidad, all these actors have what we call proper jobs. So you never considered going away to become, well, I never considered going away to become an actor. All right. Um, and so when I was at university, <laughs> I turned up and there was, you know, the drama society and they were doing all these exciting and you're plays. And oh my God, this and is I'm Christmas like, birthdays so I in one. I spent all my time involved with that. And um, I'm lucky that I graduated well. <laughs> I was going to say. Basically, I was very lucky. And, um, and people around me were going, okay, well, you know, drama school, drama school. And I'm like, oh, I want to go to drama school. That's what I want to do. So it was at that point that I found out that's what I want to do. And I had to bring When it did it parents. first dawn on you that as such that acting is my passion, this is what I really want to do or pursue seriously? I was, well, that's when I realized I wanted to pursue it seriously. But right. I was okay. very lucky as a child um, in the 70s. Um, <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> um, my, uh, I was, I, like I said to you, I was, I was brought up essentially an only child, so I was a little bit lonely. A so bit of no friends, jolly no friends. I did actually. With the dog dress? Um, I do actually have that picture. Uh, but um, also, at, the at that time, um, there were a, a couple of, a few people who were coming back to Trinidad who had been training in the States, who had trained with Alvin Ailey, who had been to Juilliard, etc., and been to, or, or my, my mentor yeah. um, and drama teacher had been in Canada. And they came back at that point and started to give these lessons to, to kids about, you know, using all the stuff that they had learned. And so I was really lucky to get in with Tony Hall, who's become a huge figure in Trinidad Theatre, and Noble Douglas, who is just a grand dame of Trinidad dance and theatre and, and children's um, education. Right. And, um, and they, and thanks to them, I had somewhere to put all this inspiration. Yeah. And then was able to participate in a couple of TV things because my brother, in Trinidad, in Trinidad because right. my brother Christopher Laird and my brother-in-law Bruce Paddington ran this company called Gayel. Well, no, it was called Banyan back then. Right. And they did some TV Has stuff. Has the name since changed? No, it's changed into something else. Um, but Banyan, because right. um, they're, 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 
the aim always was to kind of promote and feed back into the, the community. into the yeah. culture. Yeah. And a banyan tree is exactly yeah. that. It grows, it grows up, and then and it's got roots down. that yeah. come back down into the earth. And that is that cyclical event. Very significant name. Correct. That's very significant. As you say, it grows, but it, it gives comes back. back into yeah. Earth. yeah. Now, your first job in TV, because you did blurt it out just now. My first job in TV, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, it's not the one I want to talk about, but I, I was, um, there was a thing that Banyan did called Who the Cap Fits. Right. I was 10. <laughs> and, um, and you're going you're gonna to laugh at this. So that's a Bob Marley tune. Right. right? Who the, the cap, cap fits. fits. Let them wear it. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And they used that, but it was actually done for family planning. It was a song. <laughs> okay, moving right along. <laughs> it was, but it was like one of Trinidad's first soap operas, and it was really. And it was really called Who's the Cat Okay, I didn't know that. That must have flown past me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you were 10. Okay. Yeah, I was 10. I was in 10. I was, and I was in that. I had a scene with my friend Anna Walcott. So we had this I, scene together. I, can't I mean, I've been hearing these names. Yeah, Walcott. Yeah. And yeah, yeah you know, yeah, it just yeah. makes you feel like home. You're there. Yeah. Exactly. It does. When you came to London, what was your first encounter with acting on a professional level? But this is what I can't remember because I had two things. Right. One was like a really tiny little something um, uh, on EastEnders. Right. It was Nick Cotton's trial. He was oh, up okay. for something and I was like the clerk. Everybody stand, everybody sit, All that right. kind of thing. Trying to do my RP accent, so <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I'm confused whether it was that or there was uh, The Bill. I did an episode of The Bill. Um, ironically, I've recently worked with uh, someone who I did another bill with, um, Carl Collins. Right. And um, so that obviously figures somewhere in yeah, there, but I don't there. think that was, that was my first one. I think that might have been another one that I did. But also, more importantly, there was um, a black theatre company back in the day right. when I graduated called Double Edge. Yes, and I know that, name. that was run by Amani Naftali and and people like that. And when I came to this country and when I started acting, there were several uh, black theatre companies. Um, and as you know, Barry, we now have one of those as a surviving black theatre company yeah. called Talawa. Correct. I mean, there are other things growing now, but yeah. of the ones that were Prominence here, from there, that Double Edge, the Temba, etc. Um, Talawa is the one that they've, they've all disappeared through yeah. um, funding being pulled and um, that's a very serious thing. Absolutely. And so it's great that, uh, that people are forging back and going, okay, well, you know, trying to reclaim the space, but it's such a different market now. It's like, do we focus on the internet? Do we focus on television, film, yes. do we focus on theatre? So it's, it's much more disparate, whereas, whereas the target was clearer. I yes, it I, was more precise and direct. It was just this one direction, but now yeah. there are possibilities. Correct. Which could make it even bigger. It's, it's questionable. Absolutely. You know? And there's more people and it's a bigger yeah. market. And, and so it should be. So but as you say, be. a lot of people came through those companies yeah. that were there, you know, like Chris Tummings, yeah. or who have been guests on this show. And yeah. Will Chris Johnson. Tummings. They've all Listen, I used to watch Chris Tummings, Judith Jacobs, all those people. No problem. <gasps> In no <laughs> yeah. Victor Romero, when I was in Trinidad, when right. I was a okay. teenager in it Trinidad. It went to Trinidad, did it? Yeah, okay. it aired in Trinidad. So I, wow. used to, and I, used to, I tell that to Judith when I see her, I'm like, I still watch you. And she's like, okay, sorry, that was a bit hysterical. <laughs> oh, we wouldn't I have went it back any to other way. Years. Yeah, did, yeah. I went back to teenage years, and that was literally how I spoke yeah. to Judith. Yeah. But all of them came through those, those companies. Yeah. And it, in a way, it's sad that they've not grown. Yeah. They've, you know, they've disappeared and you've only got one now. Well, absolutely, so. but they grew, but they were cut short. Yeah. Um, and that's what, the, that's what the sadness is there, is that um, this country has not yet solved the continuity. 
yeah. is not yet solved how to let something continue to thrive. It's like there's regrowth and regrowth yes. and regrowth. It's just for um, a moment and then yeah, it's pulled or I'm, taken. And, um, and really the investment needs to continue to be there. Otherwise we don't end up with institutions. You know, that's why we've got the National Theatre. That's why we've got the Royal Shakespeare Company. It's because those things are continually invested in, in yeah. and, and continually focused on. Um, there was great work happening when I first got here, yeah. um, and it's it's really sad to see it reduced so much. But I think at the same time that there's a renaissance happening now, that the young people that are coming through are focused on their new kind of forms of media yeah. and um, and are learning to control that themselves. Um, so it's hopeful. It's yeah. Hopeful. Well, we can always hope. Yeah. Because if you give up hope, then that's it, isn't it? You well, can't no. give up hope. No. <laughs> you can't no. ever give up hope. There's no giving up hope. And in the in the meantime, you know, while you're hoping, yeah. you're actually putting the work in to help this happen. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I was very lucky early on um, to find places where I get to work with young people as they're coming up, and that's all. I, Last term, I begged to be able to go back and do some teaching. I was like, I miss it so much. And, and where um, were you teaching? I teach at a place called WAC, Weekend Arts College, Arts and Media, and it's up in North London. Um, and their MO is about uh, providing access to training in arts and media for right. young people who might not normally access that, yeah. or to diversify what the training is in some way. Because you're a big champion of diversity, aren't you, in the profession? Well, yeah, and... I come from Trinidad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. You know. um, but also, I mean, diversity is such a kind of vague term. Um, and, 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 and that, like, all kind of all covering terms can become not our friend, basically. Yeah. It's like, what, what do we what mean is by it? that? But what is diversity, um, exactly? And I think that, you know, so far there's been a lot of focus, rightly, on diversifying the, um, the side of performer in the industry, so the actor that you see on screen or on stage or what have you. There's becoming a bit of a focus on the writers, which is absolutely essential, uh, and on the directors and things like that. But I've just been doing some telly, I, I finished a couple of days ago, and I, my heart sang to see a black female director turn up on set. I mean, I knew that she was going to be there, obviously, but mm. when she turned up on set, I literally felt elated. Um, and when you see a crew who look diverse, but also because I've done um, a theatre piece this year that was very important to me, and it was about the Windrush generation. Okay. Um, what was that and where was that? It was called Shabin, okay. uh, directed by Matthew Zia. And we started off in Nottingham because it's about the Nottingham riots. Right. So we started on Nottingham Playhouse. And it's about the Nottingham riots that happened right. in 58. Okay. Sorry, Matthew, if I got that wrong, because, you know, it's a long time. Um, but uh, very few people know about these riots. And mm. what was interesting, because it was it's centered in St. Anne's area in um, Nottingham. And the audience that came in were, were diverse. I think for the first time in my life, I actually encountered diversity. Yeah. So you had the St. Anne's residents who turned up because it was either their story or their mother's story. Yes, or they were directly something. They were directly involved. involved. And they were amazed to see them. <clears throat> Cells, you know, the area reflected on a main stage. Um, and then you had your regular theatre going audience who also turned up because they wanted to see the story and they wanted to participate in that. And what happened was, um, and uh, members of the audiences of sort of places like Stratford East might be familiar with this, but yeah. what happened was that you got your black audience responding as a black audience often does. 
um, which is to respond. We talk about the call and response, which is very much part of our culture. Yeah. Right? Whether that's in a religious setting, in a cultural setting, in a musical setting, whatever Absolutely. it is, right? You respond to what well, you're saying, you physically, what you you verbally, participate. everything. Like yeah. you and I talking yeah. now, so you're responding and I'm like, whereas often people go, okay, well, you're talking, so I can't yes, talk. Yes, so I shut up. But yeah, we talk yeah. together, right? Um, so that's a black audience, is that you'll talk together yeah. <laughs> with what's happening on stage. Going, Shh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got your regular theatre going audience, um, whether that's white or not, or whatever it is, that's for the theatres to determine. I don't know, yeah. I'm not an expert. But um, who then took things very seriously. And what I loved was that there was room for both those responses in, in, the, in the audience, in the auditorium. And each one felt that they owned the story. Right. And to my way of thinking, until you diversify your audience, you're not actually talking diversity. Because yeah. otherwise, you're presenting the same picture uh, to the same audience, and therefore telling the same story. And over all and you're doing again, yeah. is colorizing the picture yeah. a little bit. In but a different it, it setting, but you yeah. know, it might be a different setting, Correct. but but basically yeah. it's the same story to the same people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And as you say, the diversity thing, you have to be specific. What do you mean by diversity? Yeah. It's not just on screen and who you're what seeing. What does that mean? You want black writers, Mate, absolutely. you know, directors, producers, Correct. right through the board. So, so when I'm you're part doing... of Act for Change, and Act for Change has always made it clear, um, which as you know, is a sort of pressure group, I yeah. guess, um, around all of this. And it's always made it clear that, you know, when we're talking diversity as Act for Change, because I'm part of other groups, but for Act for Change, what we're talking about is literally representation. And it's yeah. not just a race issue. It is class, because that's another big issue that raises its head very much in the, in the entertainment or industry or whatever you want to call it in this country. Um, it's ability or disability, however you want to say see yeah. that. It's gender, it's, um, you know, it's transgender, it's all the rest of it that does not get represented. So it's, you know, now is a time. And I think, I think it needs to be a weave. I, need, I think that you don't want to come through piecemeal. That, yeah. you know, you come through and then I hope I come through and then I might come through that hole that you made or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's, like, it's like, no, because the gatekeepers, which is a very common and popular phrase, go, listen, man, I bent over backwards for you for that last thing that you demanded of me. Yeah. Um, so can you just bring it all together? Just tell me what it is you want. And I think we all need to pass through. And I love that you've Not said that. Not when it passes the wrong way, but we need to move forward together. And I love that you said that for the simple reason out there, there are a lot of positive things happening. Yeah. A lot of people doing positive things, yeah. positive ideas, positive action. But as you say, it's piecemeal. One over there, yeah. one over there, two over there, three over there. And it, none of it is forceful enough or powerful enough to yeah. make a difference. Yeah. And you're trying to constantly say, you know what, you need to come together yeah. as one entity, support each other, and move yeah. forward. I'm, 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 we can never, I don't know, I, I agree, but I don't think it's necessarily one entity. But well, it's, I admit that there are so many entities. Yeah. Because the minute, minute you go one, you go, well, who was included in that one? Were you included in that one? <laughs> <laughs> Were you included in that one? I don't know. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, no, it, we need to know that the, the, the space needs to be made for all those who turn up because this yeah. country is part of a global phenomena is part of a global energy or whatever. I'm, I'm really choosing my words carefully because yeah, this is such yeah, a kind yes. of a delicate time. Subject indeed. <laughs> Subject I'm, and I'm time. I'm really tripping myself over here. But, um, but at the end of the day, we need to rec recognize that we're global. If we want to be global in our markets and in our culture and in our expression, we also need to be global in the people who live around us. Yeah. Okay? And, um, and once we acknowledge that, we don't know who's coming next, what's coming next, what the but problems or the least, joys are going to be. Yeah, so we have to room admit, them, make room for because them to, we are benefiting from our position in this world. And we then must return. And as I always say, favor. you know, there is enough to go around. Yeah. There is enough for everybody. Yeah. There's enough to go around. Correct. But we are bred since 
yeah whenever to believe mine, in mine, the idea yeah, of scarcity yeah, and lack mine. but that's a very <laughs> deliberate thing which pits us all against and each, each other, other exactly. because but 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 i recognize that when um when i was when i was a young actress and i would go to these meetings because back in the 90s early 2000s it was not the you know casting the industry was not operating on the scale that it does now and so there was like, oh God, she got that part. And that's it. That's, that's, that's the one part for the year. <laughs> yeah. Ain't nobody gonna work now because <laughs> she got that part, you know. So, um, so we'd go along to these castings and you'd meet the same people. But what I found started to happen for me was I would meet these wonderful people like Indra Ove, Reiki Ayola, Tanya Moody, etc. Sharon Duncan Brewster. And I go, hey, last time I saw you, such and such was happening in your life. Well, last time I saw you at the last meeting where we were yeah, all yeah. waiting on, what's happened? And we started this kind of, just like this kind of circle yeah. of support. And I just went, you know what? We need to be just backing each other. Each other. Because there is no other artist performance art that um sorry that was a redundant statement but there's no other performance art where you are pitted against the people with whom you have most in common if you were a musician and you met people that you have stuff in common you'd play together if you were a dancer you would dance together mm. and it's only as actors and actresses that we are pitted against each other well you know i you see the enemy. similarities definitely from the modeling days back in the right. 80s because you were a model yeah yeah you know and you would go to an agency and they say well we've already got a black guy and there i'm you go. thinking yeah but you've got 300 white guys <laughs> showing You're you right. this room for another one You're right and i remember it was a, a big company mm -hmm. uh, we went to an audition and they specified we had to turn up in suit and tie so the black guys turn up in a suit and tie and we turn up and there are these white guys there in jeans and a t-shirt and a jacket and we're thinking okay so they've already got the job yeah and they've got these 10 black guys walking up and down for this show you know doing the choreography doing it better than the choreographer but they only want to choose one okay. and you're actually thinking well, you know what, why don't you sack those six guys over there that can't and count have eight all of us. and have all of us, can't count eight. right? But, you know, no, they just wanted one of you. And we made a stand, and when we realized what they were doing, we all just walked out because we thought, no, I'm not going to allow you to pit yeah. me against these people. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it's just not healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And the mindset is Absolutely. not healthy and what it creates. So, you know, it, we were just happy to say, well, if all of us can't get it, none of us will get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and that was it. Absolutely. And in a similar spirit, I came together with a couple of Trinidadian actresses, um, Renee Castle and Indra Ove, to do Mustafa Matura's um, Three Sisters, or sometimes called the Trinidad Sisters, which is obviously based on Chekhov's the right, Three Sisters. Yeah. Um, and we did like a performed reading of this a couple of times. It was really successful. The audience were so kind of involved in it. We had, um, I remember, I won't say his name, but there was a beautiful young actor that we had working with us who said, my God, I'm going to play a classical scale love interest. I didn't know that I was allowed to sp play anything other than gangster number three. <laughs> that gets you know killed I mean? in the first gets 10 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so this was essential. And we tried to get this uh, put forward. But what we were told was that um, it had been done in the last eight years or it had been done in the whatever. Um, and ironically, there were at least two productions of Chekhov's Three Sisters on that year um, in the country, and there were two Uncle Vanyas within a hundred yards of each other. Right. Okay, and the problem here is that 
we have we do have wonderful writers we do have wonderful actors and productions and all of this Just as but until else, yeah. you can build a classical canon until your young actors have something to refer to, to go, I can also play these parts, not just the part that the mainstream want to see me as and cast me as and, yeah. and limit the stereotypical. me stereotypical. Um, uh, until we build our own canon, we're not going to have that wealth available and we're going to always be starting again and again and, and again. again. And young people will not know what the generation before did, the generation before will not know who was here before them. And, um, and, and also, that I work with young people all the time. I am fascinated and I am liberated every time I work with, with young people in this industry. Yeah. They are so much... Uh, more ahead, they're so much more open, inspired, spunky, enthusiastic. I, yeah. I really am, uh, I, I learn every time I work. Yeah, and you know, it's the difference of the mentality of the generations. Mm. Whereas the older generations were kind of, well, you don't say that, you don't talk about that, you just keep that quiet. The younger generation, as you say, they're just open, they just say, well, this is what it is. So <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I, I hear you. And that's a debate that's going on at the moment. When I got here, my, the generations before me are pretty outspoken people. Oh, yes. That, I've got mm. the example of your Albie Jameses, your Alton Kumalos, your Anton Phillips, your, yeah, Anton um, Phillips, wow. you know, your Yvonne Brewsters, Mona Hammonds. Um, they were not short of a word or oh, two no, to say, but and I, they I, forged I, a path. Yeah, but I think in the majority, they were the minority. They weren't the majority. You know, the majority. I'm going to challenge were. you, Barry, because after them came Black Theatre Co op, came BB Crew. They're going to be rolling on the floor in a minute. Gonna, <laughs> came the posse, came, you know, et cetera. Okay. I can't even begin to. Black Double Edge, um, you yeah. know, et cetera, Black Theatre Mime, et cetera. Do you, I, I'm sorry I've said that name wrongly, but do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. They were out there doing, but it was a different process. It was like everything came through the arts. Council and everything. <laughs> the and you have to apply yeah. for this and blah, 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 you know. But now we're looking at a different dynamic. It's a Arts different council market. Council was always it's pulling the strings, and it's a, absolutely. It's a when different. When they wanted to pull the well, there's an internet now. Mm. Whereas you know, when I came here, um, the BB Crew or the Posse would be out leafletting, and that's how they would get their yeah. audiences in. Now you're going to tweet. Yeah. So now you stay home and you tweet. You can tweet, exactly. Facebook, you Facebook or whatever. Insta, Instagram. Insta, but that, yeah. people were outspoken and they yeah. were strong. Um, but the the scale of communication is different. Yes. Um, uh, but what happened was that they they kept the door open. Mm. And I think you know people can now hopefully start to come through the door. But there's going to be another door. And they're going to have to keep that door open for the other people to come through that door. And that's literally what happens. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. Yeah. What is your role in Screen Nation? In Screen Nation? Nation. I don't have a role in Screen Nation. I'm you honored are screen to Nation. have. You are Screen no, Nation. <laughs> Ask Charles Thompson. I'm I know. Screen Nation. No, he um, is I screen was Nation. honored to have won uh, an award for Screen Nation back in. It might be early 2000s, I can't remember. <laughs> okay. um, but then they were called BFM. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I remember going to the first one, before I was nominated for something, I remember going to one of the first events that they had. And I was doing casualty at the time. We were based in Bristol. A whole bunch of us That's came down That's when from... I fell in love with her. <laughs> comfort Jones. <laughs> yeah, comfort, yeah. comfort. I was like, I would switch on casualty and just go, right, where's comfort? comfort I don't care about Jones the rest. I don't care character. about Charlie. I don't care about any of the other Duffy. Oh, I, I love them all. I love them all, but I but want to comfort. I was lucky, man. Comfort Jones was like a warrior woman. And she was hanging out the back of ambulances, just jumping off tall you. buildings as a bird, as a Played. No, it was comfort. It was comfort. Yeah, it was comfort. But um, so we came, a bunch of us came to town to be there at one of the earliest events that Charles, uh, etc., um, staged. And I tell you, we went back to Bristol. I don't think I stopped smiling for like three days. Yeah. 
just to have this. been around the people that were of the industry that shared something with me across generations. The appreciation of there. them. And just, yeah. and just to be told, we see you. We know that you're going through a certain experience. We know we're in it together. We know, we know what it's like and we recognize achievement within these conditions. Yeah. Um, honestly, I was grinning. I just grinned for days. Um, so that's come on. And then, of course, we met each other recently again yeah, at the BAFTA, um, at yeah, the uh, BAFTA uh, when we um, did that wonderful presentation of um, Ellen Thomas and Ellen Donna, Thomas, Crow. Donna Crow and Amanda Foster, Foster who yes. also played my. Um, I was going to say because when you are hanging out the, the ambulance, yeah, that's not Amanda. Amanda. The time. They were not me doing, but Amanda's pretty great. So yeah. I mean, what a character she is. It's yeah, like, um, just Amanda. sitting on the stage, I was scared in the audience. It was like. <laughs> These are fabulous powerful. women. And for some reason, we tend to be scared of fabulous women. No, 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 no. She's a forceful character. Yeah. I mean, I'm not scared of Ellen. She's lovely. You're not scared of Ellen? No. <laughs> no, I'm not scared of Ellen or Donna. <laughs> they're they're you sweeties. They're sweeties. <laughs> they are. They're like funny. you, they're sweeties. They're hilarious. But um, you know, there was a hardness with with Amanda. And you know, when she displayed her story, you see why she had to galvanize herself to deal with what was going on. Amanda because Amanda was beautifully frank and is yes, always beautifully so frank. frank. When I've worked with Amanda, I still remember and I still have the books in my library that she recommended to me. Amanda is very very self-reflective um, and and spiritual and all these things. But I think that being a stunt woman is different to being an actress. And, that, yeah. and as an actress, you have to be ready to take on and, and assume and understand yeah. and penetrate and etc. Let's uh, you know, people who know me know that I can go <laughs> down that conversation a bit too far. But um but uh, for Amanda and the stunt people I meet, because they are always so interesting, they are extremely strong. Like we've worked um, recently, and I work a lot with um, someone called Kevin McCurdy, and right. you know, etc. They're, they're these they're amazing because you meet them, and they're so calm when they're in their professional situation. There's this kind of Zen thing. Right. It's like Kill Bill. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then when they show you what you need to do, it's like you don't want to mess with them. And a man does that. Yeah. But when we encounter it in a woman, we're just like, I don't understand. I don't understand that. And I just think it's fabulous. It's fabulous. It's alive. It's so definite. It's so solid. And yet so yeah. movable. It's wonderful. I mean, that, that occasion at the BAFTAs the other day was, again, beautiful. I was smiling for the... Right. For the rest of the week, and right. in actual fact, I was supposed to go somewhere after, and I thought, you know what, I don't, I don't want to high. go. <laughs> that literally, I thought, I don't, I don't want to go somewhere yeah. that's not gonna meet this, yeah, and um, bring me down from I know, where I am, right? Because I left there like this, yeah. and as you can see, I have a lot, of, a lot of teeth. So. I didn't leave there. I just stayed with the ladies. I stayed with Donna and Ellen, and we were just liming. As liming, we as we we said. Were just liming. Yeah, it was great. Now, Shakespeare, because mm. we this is definitely a Shakespearean actress. Mm. Your first dalliance with Shakespeare was? My first dalliance with Shakespeare? My first dalliance with Shakespeare was at school. At school, I'm a right. Trinidadian. Uh -huh. We were brought up exactly. on classics. And I remember my teacher, Mrs. Davis, saying to us when she was trying to make us learn entire monologues from the Scottish play and from the rest of it, she, she said to us, these will be your friends for the rest of your life. Just trust me. And so we were like, OK. And I tell you, to this day, I will quote, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, creep in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And that I learned under Mrs. At Davis school. at school. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, they do remain your friends. They do remain your emotional inspiration. 
So, and then, of course, I then saw that play performed by Pearl into Springer and um, Devendra Duke, and uh, um, sorry, I can't remember right now, um, in Trinidad, and was so inspired, so inspired. Um, so yeah, I, when I came over here and got the chance to do these pieces, we studied under a woman called Judith Jick at uh, my drama school, who was beautiful, older woman. And sometimes if you let yourself go, because she talked with such love that you went, did you? Did you know him? <laughs> <laughs> you're just thinking, you don't look old enough, but you, the, the way you're saying it is like, you, this is a personal relationship. Yeah, that's how much she felt that's it. That's how much she felt it. I was like, you went out with him, didn't you? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I, I, I love the language. And I think as a West Indian, we love the language. Yeah. Um, one of the first Shakespeare's I did, uh, in a way, was a radio production for BBC, which okay. we did with Felix Cross was directing. We did um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, but one Felix of my favorites. Felix set it in yeah. a Trinidadian setting because... So was that in Trinidad? No, oh, it was yeah. over here. It was in, in the BBC. Here. Right, okay. At, in, at Bush House. Um, but the thing is, if you watch, if, for those of you who will get the kind of crossover here, is if you look at it, it happens over the same space of time that Carnival does. Okay. Between, between Dimanche Gras, which is the Sunday celebrations, and Ash Wednesday, Wednesday. okay, which yeah. is the repenting on the Wednesday <laughs> when everybody comes to their sane mind. After and the Tuesday. After behavior. the Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> and yes. all that happened in there, it is exactly the time scale. In fact, I'm giving away too much. I shouldn't elaborate on this anymore. Oh, it's lovely to hear that. But um, he did this fantastic um, uh, Trinidadian version of it, therefore, that he found fitted the time scale. And so he used Calypso and the rest of it. And Oh my God, I have never laughed so much. I was working with other Trinidadian actors. My friend Hayden Ford was on it, um, Jim Finley, et cetera, et cetera. Um, actually, we had Claire Benedict. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I don't want to, I, I don't want to mess up, <laughs> mix up all the different productions, but yes, Claire Benedict, George Harris, et cetera. And it was fabulous. And we had such a laugh because the language fits completely to the meter. Yeah. And the way that the language needs to be played with and felt and be sensual and be another character in the play um, with Shakespeare, um, Trinidadians are that. Right. They yeah. play with language, they mess about with meter, they, they mess with the interpretation and the emphasis and where the, you know, all of that yeah. goes. Um, and yeah, we had a ball. We had a ball. I'd love to see more of that done. And that was here on that was radio. It, yeah. radio. On radio. Yeah. When did you get to play Shakespeare on stage for the first time? Well, uh, back in the day, in the 90s, late 90s. Um, <laughs> 90s you know, is just the I'm other actually day. not really coy about any of this. I don't know why I'm pretending to be coy. I guess I feel I'm supposed to. No. But um, I'm not. Um, I was at the RSC for the first time, and I was doing Choice and Cressida. And what was the other Shakespeare play? There was Choice and Cressida. I was doing something called Three Hours After Marriage. Oh Ten Minutes of the Shrew? No, 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 not at the time. I have done that since. Okay. But um, I, I got the opportunity to go on because Victoria Hamilton was, had got laryngitis. And I got the, uh, bless her, understand. and she's a mate of mine. So right. I got to go on as Cressida, which was every bit of fear that you can imagine is going to well, happen. I'm sure, I was it's the first time. And I went on... Um, and that's a really essential and beautiful and dynamic and tragic part. And um, yeah, it was it was just great. It was just great. So I went. And where the was Barbican. that? That was at the Barbican, Barbican. audience. Wow. Of however many you know, um, etc. So that was my first real Shakespeare, and then. In the last couple of years, I've done a nothing string. but Shakespeare. 
And you know what? You you have to be very careful of what you put out there and what you wish for. Because when I when the string of Shakespeare started that I've done, which I'm so blessed for, um, I I realized it was an answer to a request I put to wow. the universe because as the first one happened facebook i am a facebook person so, <laughs> um came up with one of those memories that they do and they said there was it was one where i went i'm dying to do more shakespeare oh, and uh, bearing your soul to the universe to and on facebook social and then media. it went okay you want Shakespeare? Let me give you Shakespeare. You want Shakespeare? Let me give you Shakespeare. I've been so lucky. I've been so lucky. And then since then I went, okay, can I do some modern plays? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. Oh, <laughs> it Hello. It was brilliant. It was great. And then I carry on. So which Shakespeare have you done? Oh gosh. I've Because you said there's a I've string. I've done Troilus and Cressida. We I've done Macbeth. I've done um, Coriolanus, I've done Julius Caesar, Henry the Fourth, Tempest. Um, wow, well, really a string? Yeah, 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 loads. Um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm. Um, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember. There's more. I'm literally sitting, I feel like there's a story of Orson Welles sitting in a, <laughs> in a restaurant getting drunk. And someone came up to him and said, what have you ever done? And he then started to list all these things that he'd done. Um, and, but, People around him didn't realize it was in response to a question, so he just appeared to be just, <laughs> no, just sitting there, listing his TV. I feel a little bit like that at the moment. <laughs> Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane. <laughs> steps. I, babe, I only wish. <laughs> now you're a busy girl. Yeah. Very busy girl. What do you do to look after yourself and keep your equilibrium and oh your peace God. of mind? You sound like the family. I am. Um, we are family. I am. We, are, we are family. Not enough at the moment. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Not enough at the moment. Not enough. I've been through phases where I've done like a lot of exercise, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation and things like that. And I'm only reintroducing myself to that. And I... I haven't been. Right. Um, and that does take its Is that toll. just because of work commitments? And it's just sometimes you think, you know what, I just want to sit down family, rather than run up. Yeah. Family. Um, Responsibilities, commitments. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah, big, big family events that have happened right. in the last couple of years, um, which means that I need to find a new balance. I need to yeah. re-find some kind of equilibrium. Because the taking care of you is quite important as well to do yeah. all of that I stuff. Know. If you anybody know. wants to come and take care of me. <laughs> I'm doing a pretty good job, but you know, I'm always yeah. happy for a helper. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> Yeah, so you don't do yoga or anything like that? You I'm, just... get, I'm literally, as we're speaking, so I feel a bit of a fraud to say that I do because I'm literally just getting back into it. Getting back into yeah. it, yeah. Which is... Well, is you know, immediately, this... what, immediately you get back into it, you can feel the benefits, but you just yeah. have to do whatever it is that brings back some kind of peace of mind because it's... It's heavy out there. It's, it's busy. Out there. It's, um, this world is... But, you know, sometimes looking after yourself might be just switching the phones off. Correct. And sitting on your couch with a packet of chocolate biscuits. I didn't say that. You didn't say that. And um, your know. quilt and the TV watching Correct. Casualty with comfort. <laughs> but also, <laughs> you know, it's like you're not going to help anybody until you look after yourself. After yourself, absolutely. And I remember I can't, uh, that it's, it's kind of a quote for political... Uh, struggle is that you help another struggle by winning your own. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. exactly as this is about, yeah. you're the inspiration. You say, well, listen, she did it. This is I how can I did do it. it. And yeah. It. And, absolutely. and you so, know, it's, it's the fact that it's not always been easy. You don't necessarily come from a silver yeah. spoon in your mouth, but you did it. And who is it that says, you know, for a black woman to look after myself is actually a political act? <laughs> Who said that? Well, I'm, I'm right now, I'm juggling all my influences in my brain. So it might have been Angela Davis, it might be Audrey Lord, it might be one of these, I think it might be Audrey Lord. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, because they're essentially carers and nurturers of others. It's for every reason, it's a political act. To look after yourself, to be your own inspiration, to uh, be the best you that you want well, to be. Yeah. Is um, is is 
an act of some kind of statement. Yeah. Well, my darling, it was an absolute <laughs> honor. I have to grab Thank these you. hands. I can't believe I'm touching Martina Liz's hands. <laughs> Love you. Thank you so much Thank for taking you. time out of your busy schedule great. to talk chatting. to us. <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> Lovely Thank to you see you. Lovely to talk with all you. And best, all the best darling. for the future. And you. Thank you and very you. much. I look forward to the rest of your series. Yes. We're, we're working hard. Yeah, you Bringing are. greatness like you oh, baby. to everyone. Thank you. you know? Blessing. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for joining us. What a treat that was today. If there's anything that resonates with you during the show, please leave us a message. We'd love to hear from you. Until next week, take care. See you then. Lovely. Thank you so much.